So welcome to this Tobacco University video. We're going to be looking at identifying chemicals with spectrometry. We're going to get into some of the details, but this is that quick overview. We have a light source, a sample, we have a dispersion element, we have a detector, and we're going to generate a, at the end a spectrum here. So first off, we have to understand color because we're going to be looking at different wavelengths. And light is a form of energy and travels in a wave. And the light's wavelength, measured in nanometers, abbreviated NM, uh, determines the color. So we can see here the red wavelength has a red coloration, and then we have the green, and we have the blue. We have all these different wavelengths. Red has a longer wavelength than the blue example here, and that's what allows us the separation of colors. We see the uh, kind of also represented here in the upper proportion. Now the color that you see, so the color that you're interpreting, if we're looking at this ladybug here and we're seeing a red color, well white light's coming in and this uh, bug is absorbing many of the colors. However, red wavelength light is being reflected. So keep in mind that objects typically selectively absorb specific wavelengths of light. The color you see is the color or wavelength that is being reflected. In the case of a white surface, all white light's coming in and all the wavelengths are being um, also reflected off that surface and we interpret that as white coloration. So we take a white light and put it in a prism, you can separate out into the different wavelengths. When we see, start seeing colors, we're seeing the color that is reflected. Now the basics of kind of the spectrum, the spectrophotometer is that it measures the absorbance of a solution as light of a spe specified wavelength is passed through it. So what does that look like? Well, here we have a light source that goes through a lens and it goes through a prism and basically separates it out into different wavelengths. We then have a machine that can select um, a very specific wavelength from there. So here we're seeing we're selecting that kind of yellow wavelength here. Then we have our sample solution in a cuvette, and we have a detector, and we have a digital meter um, or display here. So we're observing or we're seeing what gets passed through. We know what the machine knows, what was basically um, sent. Uh, then we're looking at passing it through the sample, and we're detecting to what is basically passed through that sample. So what does a spectrometer look like? Well, this is an example of one here. And they have sensors that determine the amount of a specific wavelength of light is being absorbed by a chemical solution. If no light is absorbed, the absorbance meter will read 0, 0.00. As wavelength is uh, being adjusted, the absorbance will also change because there'll be a difference in that absorbance reading. Results can be graphed to develop an absorption spectrum for a given chemical. And what does an exorbitant spectrum look like? Well, this is a very basic example here, but this simply acts as like a fingerprint for a chemical. This can also allow for comparisons to occur since two different substances to determine if they're the same substance or if they're the same substance. And then known to unknown also for a chemical comparison there. So based on the absorbent spectrum generated will tell us the similarity of two substances, particularly if two are unknown, whether or not they're a match for each other. So we're looking at preparing our chemicals for the spec analysis. Chemicals must be in a liquid form, which may require dilution, so it's important to keep in mind. Cuvettes must be used that match the experiment, and there's different types of cuvettes available. Um, use distilled or tap water depending on the material you're being tested. Keep in mind we often uh, will use just the kind of the chemical solvent as what we call a blank. So this is a cuvette uh, that just simply has the chemical solvent which is being analyzed and dissolved in the, the known or unknown sample and this allows kind of for that correction of any potential data noise. Now proper cuvette handling, so keep in mind that because this is such a precise procedure, we want to be very careful in how we're handling our cuvettes. We, we want to ensure that we're using the proper cuvette materials for step one, and then we also want to avoid direct contact when handling the transmission sides. So when we talk about transmission sides, what does that mean? Well, if we look at our cuvettes example here, we can see there's definitely two clear sides and two more opaque sides. The clear sides are the ones that's going to be that light's going to be projecting through. So we want to avoid contact with those. We want to be sure that before replacing that into the machine here, we're wiping that cuvette with tissue paper uh, before placing there to ensure there's nothing on the outside that's going to conflict with the ability to get an accurate reading of our sample. And when we're using the spectrophotometer here, 
you want to follow the directions since each is unique. However, the basics that apply for all of them is you want to let the machine warm up. That can be a very short duration or very long duration. Make sure you're allowing that sufficient time for that. You want to enter the desired wavelength that we're going to be studying. Insert the cuvette containing a blank solution, making sure the clear sides are where the light is passing through. We don't want to insert it the wrong way. Uh, and then we want to zero that solution. We want to repeat the basic process for the samples. We first start with the blank that kind of controls uh, any of the solvent, takes out any of that noise, and then we want to proceed with our samples there. Um, some are digital, some will have knobs, some will have meters, so just keep that in mind there. When we're creating that absorbance spectrum, so with a sample plot, the absorbance versus wavelength, keep keeping the sample sample the same, the wavelengths will be changed and the resulting absorption reading should be documented. So we're noticing as we change our wavelength here in this example, we're also having a change in absorbance and we're documenting that. The goal here is to determine the number of peaks the sample may have, which will aid in developing an idea of specifically what substance we might be dealing with.